Hello, and welcome to this MCMA webinar, Trends to Watch in Motion Control. My name is Joanna Keel, and I am the Manager of Marketing and Membership for the MCMA. This webinar will be recorded, and a link will be sent to you within the next 24 hours. If you have any questions, please submit them in the questions panel of your webinar screen, and we will answer all questions via email after this webinar has concluded. And now, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Kristen Lewatsky. Kristen is a contributing editor for Motion Control Online and has written about motion control and automation for more than seven years. As a technical writer, she covers a variety of subjects ranging from memory in microelectronics to nanotechnology to laser and photonics. Kristen previously worked as an engineer in NASA's Chandra X-ray Telescope before switching to writing about technology. Kristen holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics and a Master in Optics and Photonics from the University of Central Florida. And this webinar is sponsored by Micromo. Since 1961, Micromo has been a market leader for the widest range of high-precision rotary and linear custom motion solutions to markets such as medical, defense, and robotics. As a member of the global Fall Harbor Group, Micromo brings together cutting-edge, high-performance, and energy-efficient products and technologies from around the world, such as brushed, brush, brushless, stepper, thin profile, piezoelectric and linear DC motors, encoders, and gearheads to the North American market. Decades ago, it started with Fall Harbor Coil, the landmark invention that paved the way for the DC motor market. Today, Micromo partners with customers to deliver innovation to the market first. Thank you again to our sponsor, and now I'd like to hand it over to Kristen to begin. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Um... Thanks to everybody uh, who dialed in today, and thank you especially to Micromo for making all of this possible. Um, so let's see. It seemed like a good time at the end of the year to sort of step back and take a look at what's been going on. Um, usually, I kind of play the, the game of follow the money first, so I thought I'd take a look around and see what's going on in terms of market research projections. Um, we've got some good news coming down the pike in terms of growth. Uh, in particular, the uh, global motion control market is expected to get almost to $22 billion by 2020. Compound, at, compound annual growth rate 6.7%. Uh, the source markets and markets in particular point to Asia Pacific as being a strong growth area and that region currently holds 41% of the market. Um, now the challenging part here is the Chinese economy, and that's kind of the big dog in the region. It is having some challenges right now. Um, they've been in a high growth phase, but that's starting to ease off some, um, and the uh, growth levels, uh, IHS, is projecting will fall about 6.5% this year and 6.3% next year down from 106 back in 2010. Um, so, you know, that that is kind of a big effect. Now, there's other information out there, servo motors and drives market. Um, that's expected to be about 12.5 billion by 2020. Again, uh, markets and markets a uh, nice healthy compound annual growth rate. In part, they think that um, you're seeing deeper penetration of servo motors into markets because uh, the rare earth uh, magnet bubble has popped and the uh, prices have been dropping. Uh, they're looking at automotive, transportation as being a strong growth. Again, they're pointing to Asia Pacific. Uh, as a 7.2 compound annual growth rate. And the other data point, and, and they, uh, after Asia Pacific, really Europe and the Americas are the other two major markets. European drives market is expected to go to about 1.35 billion by 2018. Now that encompasses all kinds of drives, um, servo drives as well as VFDs and so on. Um, that said, they're still looking at uh, the servo market to grow most quickly, kind of the usual suspects. 
machine tools, automotive, packaging, um, also electronics and communication. So that's kind of what we're working with right now. Um, and as probably everybody out there is no doubt aware, market dynamics have really been changing um, the last five or ten years in terms of market models. You know, it used to be you put up a line and would dedicate a 24-7 to producing the same thing. Um, the economy, these days everybody's doing lean operations or trying to minimize cost, uh, drop cost of ownership, um, and really remain nimble. So that's kind of the envelope in which we're working. So I figured the first thing I wanted to do when I started um, getting ready to do the talk was take a look. I did one of these about two years ago. And in all honesty, I was expecting to open it up and see a lot of overlap between kind of what I consider hot trends now and what I considered hot trends back then. And I was really surprised to see that there isn't as much overlap. Um, what was going on uh, at the end of 2013 was very much component oriented. Now I've been covering this market for nine years, going on 10, and a lot of what the, the big news was when I was first covering was smart components and integrated components. And it's kind of one of the fun things about what I do besides not getting calls at 3 in the morning to um, address crises uh, is being able to see technology go from the lab level and the gee whiz to being kind of every day out there on the factory floor and in use. And certainly that was what was going on by 2013. And in particular these days, you know, you're seeing a lot of the integrated components, intelligent components, distributed control used to be, you know, gee whiz, it's great if you can hang the drive out on the machine, but you know, forget it if you're trying to do any kind of coordinated motion. Those systems have gotten a whole lot better. Um, industrial Ethernet used to be, you know, you have it and your integrator will tell you plug it in when you've got a problem and otherwise you leave the cord unhooked because you're doing dial-up. You know, these days the situation is very different. Um, so you know, all of these trends have manifested more strongly. Certainly mechatronics is no longer a novelty. It's pretty much most of your major um, technology providers have um, sizing software. They've got many tools out there now that uh, organizations can use for planning and there's you know, less of the scratching it out um, individually. But these days, a lot of the talk is not so much about discrete components, but kind of the whole is greater than some of the parts. Um, it's very much about connectivity, about pulling things together. Um, and probably everybody out there is choking a little bit right now because, yes, I'm going to start talking about big data and Internet of Things and connectivity because that's, that's where the really interesting stuff is going on. Um, and it's got some uptake now, but the big thing to keep in mind is this is the opportunity to get a competitive advantage and take on some of these technologies and see what they can do for an operation um, because they can bring in levels of productivity and reduce downtime and um, accrue savings to a degree that discrete components really can't do. Um, so let's see, first thing on the list, rare earth magnets. Um, if anybody was reading the article from November, you would already have seen kind of an update on this. But um, just kind of a quick recap, because I've got a lot of slides and a lot of ground to cover here. Um, anybody who has probably had a pulse in the last couple of years knows about the bubble. Um, what happened, broad misconception, but what happened is China um, had sort of become the de facto sold supplier uh, with aggressive pricing uh, in the rare earth elements because they kind of had some economies of scale going on. They cut their export quotas and there was kind of an immediate, uh-oh, especially since for political reasons there had been a little bit of a supply um, hitch between them and Japan. 
a few years previously, so a lot of people started doubling their order just in case. And even though there wasn't a shortfall in the grander sense, there was sort of a um, rare, you know, the effect, the uh, equivalent of a cash shortage um, when too many people were calling up. So the suppliers started raising prices because, as one analyst put it to me, they knew they weren't going to be able to fulfill orders. Now there's a broad spread, uh, widespread misconception that the uh, limited supply was what triggered the bubble, but if you look at the actual numbers from the economic sector, they never have uh, before or since hit those export numbers. This was really something that was sort of a self-perpetuating situation. Sky high prices in the summer of 2011, um, and there was hoarding going on because people wanted to take advantage of the prices uh, and engineers out there started doing what engineers do best, which is looking for better solutions, more efficient solutions. And the demand dropped, so the prices started dropping. Now everything's going the other way. Uh, prices are at record lows so that all of the uh, uh, mines that were able to reopen um, during the heyday you know, elsewhere in the world are suddenly having to think about closing back down or declaring bankruptcy. Um, but there's stuff uh, kind of coming into play, and I'm going to be doing a full webcast on this topic uh, in the early part of next year. Um, but the, China has reorganized the supply companies, and even with kind of pirate suppliers out there, um, there's going to be a greater control over the pricing. and uh, Take a look, and I think you will see the pricing start to rebound and normalize. So, so that's just sort of FYI. Enough about that. So, um, next key thing is safety, which is way beyond just uh, protecting operators. We're the goal. You don't want people's fingers to get munched, but today's safety, you can do so much more with it and just get huge savings. Uh, PLC, safety PLC, safety drives. Um, you know, probably everybody out there is familiar with uh, safe torque off uh, and safe motion and that sort of thing. Yay, you can use uh, the machine power to clear jogs and all that. But there's some really interesting stuff that people are doing that goes well beyond that, um, where you can streamline operations, you can reduce downtime, you can increase throughput. Uh, we'll take a look at a couple of examples. Um, there's a printing organization that was cleaning their rollers. And the way they used to have to do it, clean the section, um, step out of the uh, uh, enclosure, uh, jog the machine, step back in, clean the roller, step back out, jog the machine. You know, it had to be serially. But now if you can use safe direction, so the rollers roll away from the operator's hand, and you can do safe speed to do it at uh, safe speed. You can clean it continuously. And your machine builders or your OEMs can design even automatic modes, which means less time spent cleaning. Now, how does that um, manifest practically? Uh, one case study I saw, they were doing the clean and jog and spending six hours a day because it was food and beverage, they had mandatory washdown requirements. So fast forward, they started using safe speed and safe direction and kind of got rid of a little in and out of the enclosure dance. And they were able to um, cut their cleaning down to less than two hours a day. That means they got four hours of production time back by making that change. That's, that's half a shift. Um, which is you know, just really kind of mind-boggling when you think about it. So it's not just protecting operators. It's not just protecting the equipment. It's protecting your bottom line revenue. Um, another uh, case study I was told about was uh, electronic fuel injectors. And in this case, they were actually using some of the new, uh, more sophisticated safety techniques. They were using safe limited speed. But then they analyzed 
the process and they realized that um, the, the the way it was working is you know the, the part was there the operator broke the light curtain uh, made an adjustment and the machine pulled away at the safe speed but if it was pulling away there wasn't any risk that it was going to catch the operator's hand so they instituted safe direction make sure that it can't grab the operator's fingers the machine pulled away at top speed and they cut their cycle time by 10 percent which is you know again 10 percent you can increase production without buying a thing you can maintain production with your operators you can use that time for maintenance and depending on your operation I mean there are um, factories and things where you know that maintenance downtime is incredibly precious um, so again useful things um, another important thing going on out there is sensors and you know, this is where we start nudging up against the IOT word and all of that um, sensors as you're no doubt aware are everywhere um, on the factory floor these days uh, oh I did not put the uh, pricing on that this is a um, market research by an investment bank named headwaters uh, and I believe they're in Denver but they uh, said the industrial sensors market is going to exceed 150 billion 115 billion excuse me by 2019 compound annual growth rate 7.3 percent and brace yourself the industrial sector is going to be 37 percent of that market um, because that's where we start getting into all of the savings you can get from these connected machines and connected factory floors you've got to have the sensors so that you know what's going on and that's proximity velocity temperature pressure all that sort of thing um, so you want something that's going to capture your data for remote uh, monitoring you need to find a way to send that um, elsewhere in the system up to and including HMI you can send it to uh, your manufacturing um, equipment system you can you know for your shop floor to top floor you can send it out to um, portable devices to be handled by supervisors ultimately um, the sensor is most useful though for the predictive maintenance the maintenance has been evolving over the last several years I mean obviously uh, it started out if it breaks you fix it uh, there are certainly factories where that's still the case and the maintenance guys like being Superman and being the one who comes in and saves the day but most organizations um, want to avoid downtime like the plague so the next move was into preventive maintenance you know go ahead and fix it based on lifetime data um, predictive maintenance was the next thing you model you decide when it's a good time uh, um, but the really valuable thing that's going on now is proactive maintenance um, where you're able to not just kind of get an idea of when things are going to go bad but you can go looking based on the input from your sensors to discover what needs to be worked on and be able to um, schedule it into your maintenance schedule in a time so that you don't have downtime and it's convenient etc um, and that predictive versus reactive you can you know use accelerometers to uh, monitor your frequency to look for damage you can look for signatures that can indicate whether you've got a bearing failure whether or not a bearing failure but whether your bearings are starting to wear you can um, you know monitor current actually the current is what's really going to tell you about that you can find out if belts are starting to wear and all that sort of thing and the key thing is to make it easy you want the components that are able to track their own usage and send alerts I mean that that's the ideal is when you get these smart components they could say hey I got a problem and it shows up to maintenance so again it's easy to schedule it's also easy to make decisions about 
how to run the line. Um, you know, if part of the problem is um, wear and tear from turning on and off or whatever, you maybe you think about how exactly your uh, process is running. Um, and of course, monitoring motor current. Um, again, you can look for changes in torque. Is that a is it a jam? Is it a bearing we were talking about? Is the lubrication breaking down in your um, your head? You know, all these things are going to come straight to your maintenance. It simplifies everyone's life. Um, and this kind of brings us into another key trend that's going on, which is auto tuning drives. Um, machines have um, inherent resonant frequencies of operation. And you know, as you can see on the body plot here, that's going to vary as a result of the uh, um, inertia of the load to the motor. And you're going to get resonance and anti-resonance frequencies. That's why a machine will be biffing along working perfectly well, and then you start turning up the speed, and suddenly it starts bogging down and getting really sluggish, and you turn up the speed a little bit more, and suddenly it's flinging soda bottles at your head. Um, that is because of those vibration modes. And it can be, um, you know, if you notice the three curves, that's because of different levels of um, load to motor inertia. And you're, you know, changing your load can cause changes to that and push those spikes down into your operating regime um, or bandwidth of your machine. So you would kind of want to find a way to work around that. Now, back in the day, you know, you'd put the uh, accelerometer on, you look for the vibration, you analyze it, you get out there and do PID loop tuning. You sit there and tweak the pods, and depending how good you are, uh, it could take hours. It could take days, um, and then it was, you know, sort of done for the duration. The thinking was, or at least, done as well as it could be done. These days, um, auto tuning drives—they rock. Um, they are able to perform the frequency analysis themselves. They analyze it. They apply filters to remove those spikes. So you wind up flattening out that gain curve. Um, that means you get better performance. That means um, instead of having your load either out of sync uh, for the anti-resonance, out of sync with the motor, or in sync for the resonance spikes, uh, your load is showing up where it's supposed to show up. And proactive auto-tuning uh, doesn't just take care of that. It can analyze. Um, what's going on with the um, path plan for the load so that it can um, actually pull, change the, uh, the drive signal so that it doesn't excite those modes. Um, again, you get performance improvements. Now, the problem that you've got with machines is that everything wears out over time. So you get your nice little tuning and everything in there, yay, we're happy about that. But the minute a belt starts wearing or a nut loses its preload or you've got lubricant breakdown, all of a sudden things change. Your resonance spikes are going to shift and you've got these notch filters that were targeting the frequencies you wanted to get rid of. Now they're in the wrong place. And your servo starts whining. So maintenance shows up, they get out there with a laptop, but what they really need is the wrench or something that can address uh, the real problem. But again, that's where you wind up with um, benefits from the auto tuning because these um, systems, some of them can keep this going in real time and be able to look for resonances and changes. Um, and that's important because, you know, at first it might be a small change, you know, a fraction of a part per hour. Um, long term, you get a bearing failure or something, you're going to be down. Uh, and depending on what it is you're building, that can cost, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars 
an hour. Um, so these drives can now monitor that. They change the parameters to address it um, and really keep the performance going. You don't need to have the tech out there with the laptop. Um, you either have somebody pressing a button. Um, some of them can do it automatically. But the other important thing is that they need to go ahead while they're optimizing. They need to notify maintenance that there's been a change because otherwise, if it's a worn bearing or you know that nut with a preload we're talking about, that problem is going to continue. So you kind of need to have the full feature set on these guys. Um, so we're talking about all of these sensors, or billions and billions of them, um, and what that brings up is the uh, one of the phrases du jour, which is big data. Um, and it's amazing how much can be done with that kind of information, um, and and how sophisticated big data analysis is getting. One of the uh, job site that do or one of the other uh, groups I write for is uh, for an IBM custom magazine and that they're able to do big data analysis streaming so they're not even storing all of the data anymore they're just looking at it screening it grabbing out um, the stuff that they need to grab that's relevant so you can have a densely um, censored uh, for lack of a better word um, factory floor, you don't have to fill up a bunch of memory if you plan it right. Now, let me see. I'm going to try to show you guys a cool picture here. Um, Rio Tinto mine is not motion controlled, but it is a mine in Australia that has these gigantic trucks and they run 900 of them, kind of 900, without operators. They've got them censored up and down and it tracks everything. It generates about 4.9 terabytes of, of data per day, but they are able to handle all of that from a central control room and know exactly what's going on, know how they're picking the right path to minimize speed and minimize um, resource use and so on. So it can be incredibly valuable. Plus it's a really big truck and it's cool to look at. Let's see, back to the other one. I couldn't figure out how to get the uh, um, picture. Let's see. There we go. We're back in business. Um, anyway, so lots and lots of sensors, lots and lots of data, and it lets them be safe. It lets them preserve resources. Now, unless you think this might not apply um, in the factory environment, Rockwell uh, actually tried applying the technology to their plants worldwide. And if you take a look at the results here, um, they were able to cut their inventory dramatically um, and, and speed delivery and improve on time um, delivery and so on. And it really is all about having the information at your fingertips. So that's the happy part of it. But it's not easy. You've got to do it right. Um, it's, you get very enamored of all the data that you can have. And yay, um, isn't that fun? But you don't want to have to store all of that data. You want maybe to be able to do the real time better, you want to have a plan, you want to know what you're gathering, why you're gathering, um, what you expect to use it for, who's going to use it, uh, and also who's got to maintain it. Um, it's get, be, The big data uh, equipment out there means that you no longer have to worry about giant databases and doing a lot of uh, scrubbing and data maintenance. It's much, much easier to work with unstructured data. But you've still got to have the right equipment. Um, you, you've got to have servers that are highly capable, whether you're going to do scale up um, with really powerful servers or scale out with a bunch of little guys. Um, you've got to have people who know how to work with Linux 
and Hadoop or Spark. Um, they're out there, but it's still hard to track them down right now because everybody wants that technology. So, you know, kind of keep in mind, lay out your plan. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with big data is you've got to have a network that can keep up with it because otherwise, you know, that's going to be your bottleneck and you're going to have all the sensors and maybe you've got the software, but if you can't get the bytes pushed where you want them, when you need them, uh, it's still not going to help you because you've got to get the information. You've got to you've got to figure out how to convert data into actionable information and do it in a timely fashion so that it's still relevant to your operations. So that's you know that's that's kind of the big challenge. It comes back to that. Have a plan. Um, now I am putting this in a trend, but it's not by any means broadly applied right now in uh, automation um, at this point. But to me, that's kind of like the first people that were using VFDs on fans and stuff. That's an opportunity because if you you know, kind of do your homework and really figure out whether it makes sense, that's going to get you some insights and economies of scales and responsiveness that your competition might not have. So it's, you know, certainly it's worth considering, but you got to do it smart. Um, yeah, and the industries that are doing it are things like pharmaceutical and medical and oil and gas, um, where they really need to kind of keep track of things. Um, so all of this starts getting us into the big buzzword, the industrial internet of things. Um, no doubt you guys have heard and seen about the IoT until you're sick and tired of it. Um, the numbers, I think I took the slide out, but the numbers um, of industrial connected things absolutely dwarf any of the consumer stuff. When uh, the industrial IoT really gets cranking, that's going to be, you know, that industry is going to be the biggest beneficiary. Uh, it's, you know, everybody is getting very excited about, you know, being able to control your lights with your smartphone, assuming that you don't get hacked. Um, but factory floor, that's where it's going to be a big deal. Um, 2025, 5.4 billion, billion boys and girls, industrial IoT devices ship annually. Um, and a total installed base of 48.2. Um, we are talking about embedded sensors, smart components, um, communication from your machine networks to your MES, uh, transparency up and down the food chain that goes back to that whole issue. You know what's going on and you can make moves to address it. Um, you can improve efficiency, you can minimize downtime, shrink lead time, uh, reduce inventory, personalization, you know, that's what consumers want these days. So if you're making consumer goods, uh, if, uh, yeah, maybe it's blank on it, C CFG, uh, no, CPG, consumer packaged goods, um, that's going to help you deliver people what they want. Um, now this is what was challenging about pulling together the slides for this webcast is I kept feeling like it was sort of a chicken and the egg because all of these topics I could have swapped in pretty much any order because as we're talking about the IoT, what are we coming back to? Coming back to the smart drives, we're coming back to uh, integrated components, we're coming back to feedback. Um, it's all that stuff we were talking about in 2013, but now it's being used differently. So if you've got a completely connected operation and your drive faults, then it's your machine can notify the doc operator through the HMI, but it's also going to be able to communicate with the rest of the line up and down. So maybe you've got a jam. What happens is the, uh, you know, in feed and out feed or the, the modules up and down stream, they both slow down. So your operator can get in there, they can use safe torque off or safe motion to go ahead and free the jog, 
your line keeps going, so you don't have to shut everything down. You don't get downtime. You don't have to take the time for the restart. Um, and the other thing is if you've got a highly coordinated operation where you've got um, multiple steps at different locations, so you know, you're shipping drivetrains off to an assembly plant or something, you can notify those plants. So they're going to know that there's a slowdown. And that's not just notifying the people. That's notifying the equipment. So all of a sudden, everything becomes so much more coordinated. Um, downtime is so much easier to respond. And you know, net productivity is up. Um, good thing. Sounds like hype, but there's a lot to it. Um, and while we're kind of heading into the connectivity direction, let's also talk about power saving. That's a big trend that's been going on. There's a lot of been a lot of talk the last couple of years, uh, and certainly articles that I've been writing the last couple of years. Um, I've been hearing much about it because, um, especially for a while, oil prices might be down right now, but energy costs have been sky high. Um, there's concern about environmental impacts. Everybody's trying to do. Uh, minimizing uh, operations. And one way to do that is through power management. So by some estimates, um, about 25% of the operating cost of a servo axis is energy. So if you can find some way to lower that, you can save a lot of money. Um, quick kind of 101 on power consumption. Um, when you are getting charged as a utility by, uh, or when you are getting charged by your utility, I should say, they work on your peak demand usage because if you've got high peak demand, they've got to have a much stronger infrastructure to push that power to you. And that means higher costs for them. They've got to have bigger wires, bigger transformers, and all of that. So what they do, uh, in most cases for industrial customers, is they scale the rate by the peak demand of the previous month or quarter. If the organization can figure out how to lower that peak demand, you're going to lower your energy. And peak demand represents about 30% of your energy cost. So if you take a look at it, if you've got two companies side by side, um, one of them has got a 50 megawatt load, one has five, even though the 50 megawatt um, company is only running for 100 hours versus the 1,000 for the other company, their demand number is going to be 50,000. Um, the two have the same consumption, the same demand rate, but the demand charge is an order of magnitude up. And all of a sudden, boom, they're paying a whole lot more on their power. So this is really a serious way to make savings. Um, and part of the way to do that is time of use rate. Uh, I think they even have this in like consumer commercials. But you burn power during the middle of the day, and it costs money. If you do it off peak, it costs less. Um, so ideally, you want to be able to figure out when your most expensive uh, operations are taking place and try to make sure that those happen off peak. Um, and you know, then, then it kind of comes back to a question of trade-offs. So what do you wind up doing? Do you um, go ahead and work during the middle of the day, um, but you've got um, higher payroll, or lower payroll, excuse me, or do you go ahead and do the stuff at night, uh, you've got to pay higher payroll, but your power costs are lower. You've got to make an informed decision for your uh, particular operation, which brings us to the really big sort of overarching trend that I'm hearing a lot about, which is the connected factory, or the wired factory, or the smart factory, or um, all of that basically finding a way to make your operations transparent so that you can make informed decisions about what it is you're doing. Um, back to those little sensor guys we were talking about. 
got a lot of information out there. Um, and certainly there's, you know, the tried and true um, device net. You've got field buses out there that are, you know, doing your machine level um, information. But the key to making this work for you is to find a way to extract that data and get it to a place where people can make decisions. I mean, again, in some ways, we're coming back to the big data thing. How do you con how do you get that data, and then how do you convert it into actionable information, and do it in a timely fashion so that you can benefit from it? Um, the old way to do it, you could kind of do the the bolt-on approach, kind of home testing class type of components and things. Um, but you've still got to do the development side of things, programming, and you've got to figure out how to make it work. Um, fortunately, there are uh, companies out there now that are building that stuff for you so that you can get connected factories um, and really have all of this stuff ready to be user friendly, whether that you're a machine builder, whether you're an integrator. Uh, or an end user, you know, the whole goal in all of this is to make it easy and accessible. Um, one of the things this makes me think about is during the, the early days of ERP, you know, I hear all these horror stories about companies that spent, you know, several million dollars getting an ERP system in place, and a year later, or two years later, they're, um, you know, still not able to get it up and running. Because part of the problem with um, these systems is you get them in place, but you still have to keep operations going at the same time. Sorry about that. Um, ideally, you want to make sure that um, first approximation, it's easy to get the information to the operator. Now, that's kind of been in play for a while to at least some extent. But it needs to be done in a way that operators can make considered decisions, uh, pass on information. Um, but the real benefits start accruing when you get that data easily from the shop floor to the top floor. It's going from your machine network to your MES um, so that people can make business decisions and don't necessarily have to do batch processing. They can get access to it quickly and conveniently. And that's when they can start making those decisions. You know, do we have 24/7 operations so that we are able to um, get the lower peak energy demand, or is that ultimately going to wind up costing us more in labor? Um, the other thing, and this arguably could have been a whole separate um, trend piece, is a lot of this stuff is now starting to be delivered. To mobile platforms, so it's not just something that shows up if people are sitting at their desks. You know, you can um, have a tablet, you can have a smartphone, and be monitoring or even um, controlling assets on the other side of the globe if you want to. I mean, that, that's where the stuff really starts coming together, and it might sound a little bit like pie in the sky now, but it's coming. And there are people who are already doing it. Um, you know, and, and again, this is where the benefit comes in. It's having that connectivity. It's having that level of integration. You're not doing things manually anymore. And you're not finding out about things so late in the process that the problem has already been going on. I mean, one of the things I've heard before talking with folks about maintenance is, you know, we finally find out that we've got a problem, um, number one, it's been going on for weeks. And then we've got to wait until our next maintenance window. And maybe that's not for a couple of weeks, depending on the operation. So this is something where, again, you can get all of that information funneled to the people who need it so they can take action. Um, it also really provides a level of transparency so that uh, organizations are able to look across all operations and you know it kind of makes some key decisions and comparisons and so on 
you've got much higher throughput at one factory than another, you can figure it out, take a look, find out what that group is doing that makes all the difference. Or maybe it's machine to machine, maybe it's operator to operator, or shift to shift. Again, um, I came up through photonics, and one of the things that you know it kind of gets drilled into you is if you can't measure it, you can't make it. Um, you have to have some kind of metrology, and in a case like this, you can't make a decision if you don't know what's going on. Um, and again, this is kind of coming back to what we were talking about earlier with the integrated line, where you're able to take advantage of that level of connectivity. Um, so you're not spending the time. You're not spending the time restarting. You've got everything sort of um, uh, working together. Ah, so hey, wow, I almost made it through on time. Um, so wrapping it all up, we can kind of run through the, the bullet list with the uh, the philosophy of you know tell them what you're going to tell them and then tell them and then tell them that you told them. Um, what it really comes down to, though, to me, is um, that connectivity. All of this feeds into it. And that's where the benefits come from. If you've got ways to get the information and you've got, and you're thinking about ways to extract it, to make it actionable, um, that's where you're going to get the benefits. And it may not seem like something you want to do now, but you can bet that somebody out there is doing it. And your competition is going to get to it if you don't. So it really is important to start thinking about these concepts and seeing kind of how they fit in your world, um, how to make them work, and uh, what kind of benefits you can accrue because uh, there's some exciting stuff going on out there. Um, and that is what I have for now. Um, thank you again to our sponsor, MicroMo, for making this possible. And then I'm yeah. going to turn it over to uh, Joanna because I think we're done. <laughs> Great. Yeah, thank you, Kristen, for that informative webinar. And again, thanks to all of our participants today as well as our sponsor, MicroMo. Um, I also wanted to share with you an upcoming event that we're hosting called the A3 Business Forum that you may be interested in attending. The event is co-located with our sister associations, the RIA and AIA. Uh, the Business Forum is happening February 3rd through 5th in Orlando, Florida. This event is an exclusive members-only event that attracts over 500 business leaders from the motion control and motor, robotics, and machine vision industries. Registration is open and we do expect to sell out soon. You can find all the details on our website under the events section. Um, we hope that we can see you there. And again, as a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and the email with the link to the recording will be sent to you within the next 24 hours. If you did have any questions, feel free to submit them in the questions panel and we will answer those uh, via email after this webinar. And please be sure to visit www.motioncontrolonline.org for a list of our upcoming webinars. Thank you again and have a great rest of your day.